Welcome back to Development Book Club. Today we are continuing with Restoring Sanctuary, covering in this video chapter two, which is called Imagination into Reality, <clears throat> A Vision of Health. And this will really lay the a blueprint of the rest of the book, what's to come. Again, they start with a definition, which is awesome. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity and a state of optimal regulation and adoptive function of body, mind, and relationships. And there are characteristics of uh, healthy individuals or organizations. And there are six of them we're going to talk about really quickly now. The first one is the inevitability of change. So healthy in people, healthy people adapt to changing conditions. Uh, and this is seen in childhood development, obviously. Healthy organizations have a purpose, a mission, and can adapt. So purpose and direction are a must for an organization, as well as a vision, a clear understanding about what the organization does and who it serves. There's also a strong sense in a healthy organization of what it can and should become. Healthy organizations acknowledge that the emotions present with change and push for change nonetheless. So organizations that choose to adopt the sanctuary model make a commitment to growth and change. Second one, managing power. Healthy people, for example, value diversity and participation. If parents are authoritarian, for example, uh, then children are likely to imitate and command and control strategies they learn from their parents in social interactions with others as they mature. If the parents are more democratic and participatory while still exercising appropriate parental authority, then these are the traits that children will show in life. And again, same thing here with organizations. If management is authoritarian, that's what they're going to get. And we talk about envisioning safety. So healthy people are safe and secure. When people feel safe within themselves and safe with others, they do not engage in violence, any kind of violence. Healthy organizations are safe. So change is likely to be seen as an opportunity rather than a, safe, a threat in a safe organization. So this results in a commitment to nonviolence. For humans to be truly safe, they must be physically, psychologically, socially, and morally safe. This requires dedication to creating nonviolent environments that define violence and nonviolence very broadly. Number four, emotional intelligence. Healthy people can manage their emotions. Healthy organizations are emotionally well-regulated as well. A healthy organization um, access that distressing emotions are inevitable and creates the space and the time for people to be able to talk about and recover from challenges that trigger such emotions. Such conversations about these things are mandatory. Healthy uh, leaders and healthy organizations consistently model emotional intelligence and encourage healthy expression of emotions. So there's a commitment to emotional intelligence on this side. In Sanctuary, a commitment to emotional intelligence establishes the critical goal of constantly working together to make that which is unconscious conscious and to manage emotions that threaten to overwhelm our capacity to think while integrating emotional information into our decision making. So we must always be curious about what behavior means. Number five is learning all the time. So healthy people love learning and are able to adapt to changing conditions. Healthy organizations are real world classrooms. A healthy organization is a learning organization, one that learns from its successes and its failures and grasps the notion that all of its staff and clients are both students and teachers. So in chapter seven, we're gonna talk about a commitment to social learning, which uh, it is vital that we constantly create for each other learning opportunities that reduce the likelihood of recurring mistakes <clears throat> and the increase and that increase the likelihood of growth, innovation, and maturation. Next up is the constancy of communication. Healthy humans and as individuals communicate constantly, verbally and non-verbally, and healthy organizations, on the other hand, encourage conversation and feedback. So information exchange is abundant and occurs up down and sideways within the organization. There's a healthy respect for boundaries, but boundaries are not used as an excuse to be secretive. So there'll be a commitment to open communication in sanctuary organizations. Last one is justice and the common good. So healthy people are socially responsible and care about social justice. Healthy organizations, likewise, encourage individual and social responsibility. Expectations are clear and members are required to meet expectations and ask for help when they are struggling. Okay, so last thing we're going to talk about, that's sort of a, a, a sketch of the rest of the book. The sanctuary model, uh, going from transforming this vision into a reality, there's four pillars of sanctuary that the authors speak about. And we're going to just 
address those really quickly in this video will be done. First one of the four pillars of sanctuary is trauma theory. And this is the scientific underpinning of the sanctuary model. Most of our behavior is determined by previous experiences, maybe even before we were born, so things in the womb even. Uh, everyone in the organization needs to have a clear understanding about how the impact of toxic stress and trauma has affected the clients that we work with, as well as the staff doing this difficult work. So learning about the psychology of stress, toxic stress, and trauma is liberating for people. Pillar one. Pillar two are the sanctuary commitments, which are the, all of the, the values we just spoke about. So these are anchoring values that are tied uh, to a developmentally grounded trauma-informed treatment goals, as well as the overall health of the organizational culture. We're communicating that we believe in every moment by what we do and what we don't do, what we say and what we don't say, and what we reward and what we don't reward. Upon first hearing of the sanctuary commitments, leaders often believe, this is something the authors run into, that those commitments are already constitute their organizational culture, but there are often gaps in between them. Third pillar is what they call self, which is a compass that use, we can use to navigate challenging and complex interventions. And SELF is short for first safety, which is physical, psychological, moral, and moral safety in the self relationships and the environment of the organization. SE is for emotional management, so identifying levels of various emotions and moderating them in uh, response to whatever's going on. L is loss, so feeling in grief and dealing with personal loss while recognizing uh, that everything is changes, this is what loss is. And F is the future, so trying out new roles, ways of relating and behaving as a survivor. So these are already covered in sanctuary commitments, but they want to spell it out as a way to sort of compass and navigate through difficult situations. And the last one is sanctuary toolkit, which we'll get into more later, which is practical grounded, which are practical grounded tasks that support implementation. Then they give a little ad for their sanctuary certification, which I believe is very expensive, um, but they've got a whole plan for organizations. And as of 2011, the sanctuary model is considered to be scientifically backed by evidence and evidence supported. We can come back next time where we will continue to dig into restoring sanctuary.